I'm Peter Lurie, here to take you through the week on HRTV. E.T. Bear reached a milestone this week and also shared a story about how he got his start as a jockey. You had a funny story, E.T., that when you were little, your mom had to keep changing the bedspreads because you kept whipping. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, you've been talking to somebody. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'd uh, get on the bed and uh, I used to have a little horse racing game. And uh, I'd pick out one of the horses and then uh, I'd pretend like I was riding them. <laughs> so I'd jump all over the bed and uh, whip the bed and... Uh, yeah, I tore up a couple bed sheets, that's for sure. <laughs> Has it been more exciting or frustrating in the last few days trying to get to 2,000? Um, actually, uh, I haven't really thought about it at all. I mean, in my opinion, you know, you, if you just keep doing what you're doing, uh, 2,000 will come. So it seems like it's the uh, public and the uh, reporters that are focusing on it more. Bond Street has taken the lead. Final for long, Bond Street in front. Cruzati, some splendor. Bear River again, highest grade. Here's Bond Street and Cruzati. Bond Street, E.T. Baird for career win, 2,000. Congratulations out to E.T. Baird, his 2,000th winner aboard Bond Street. A little round of applause right. from here at HRTV. Well deserved. Across the board saluted international jockeys this week, and Lafitte Pinkai hosted the first bilingual episode. In many of our professional sports, the emergence of international athletes has been a phenomenon of recent decades. In horse racing, riders come to America to pursue their dream, and through the years from this group have come some of the most dominant figures. There was Braulio Baeza, the Panamanian-born Hall of Famer, Angel Cordero, three-time Kentucky Derby champion, Jacinto Vasquez, and Lafitte Pinkai, who at one point was the world's leading jockey. Responding to the Pinkai power, it's Irish Nip surging clear in its history at Hollywood Park as Lafitte Pinkai Jr. becomes the world's old-time winningest jockey. And welcome back, everyone, to this special edition of Across the Board. I'm Lafitte Pinkai, now joined by Southern California star jockey, Joel Rosario and Joel, we're going to start right from the beginning, where you were born, where you were raised. Uh, ¿A dónde naciste y a dónde creciste? Bueno, yo nací en la República Dominicana, de la ciudad se llama Castillo. Es, uh, este, na, así que crecí ahí en Castillo y luego ya que me, después que pasé de los 13 años, ya que me fui a la, a la ciudad, a la, hasta, ¿cómo se llama ya? La grande ciudad, este, ahí fue que entonces comencé de, de jockey. Entonces ya yo... Me fui por cuando tenía 13 años. You say you're a strong rider. Your strength has actually been compared to a Lafitte Pinkai Jr. <laughs> How does that make you feel when someone says that? Dicen que tienes bastante fuerza cuando montas como un Lafitte Pinkai Jr. Uh, ¿cómo, te, ¿Cómo te sientes cuando alguien te dice eso? Bueno, me siento de muy bien porque, ¿cómo se llama? A lo mejor no, porque la fui era buen jockey, tú sabes. <laughs> <laughs> este, un jinete bien fuerte y eso. No, a lo mejor no me voy a comparar con él y eso, <laughs> pero de verdad que me siento... Eso es que dicen. <laughs> me siento muy contento de ver a que la gente dice y eso, porque la FI era uno de los, de los mejores jockeys de aquí, de, de todo, el, de California y de en todo Estados Unidos. De verdad que me siento muy contento y cuando alguien, como te, digo, te dije, me dice eso así, yo me siento de verdad muy bien. Louisiana superstar Costa Rising retired this week, but trainer Glenn Della Jose couldn't be happier with his Colts career. We brought him back this year, and um, off of a 14-month layoff, he won at the fairgrounds. It might have been the proudest moment of my career, because as you both well know, being in the industry so long, that's very hard to do. And that's the type of horse he was. And we were pointing him toward uh, Champions Day at the fairgrounds, and we were pointing him toward the uh, Pole Benoit Stakes here at Evangeline, or the Attaway Darbon, either one. Um, and we were just going to try to spot out all the major stakes in Louisiana and go with it from there. But always we were looking for his personal health first. And um, he came out of that race sound. You know, I galloped him a few days after. Everything looked good, but I just had a feeling something wasn't right. So I sent him to his uh, regular veterinarian for an examination and a uh, complete examination. And uh, an ultrasound revealed that he had strained uh, a suspensory ligament on the same rear leg that he had injured in 07, which forced him to the sideline. 
at that point in time, I contacted Mr. Castillo, who was vacationing in Montana, and we discussed it, and we decided that it's time for him to step aside. You know, we could run his horse again, but enough is enough. I mean, you know, nobody likes to see an old football player on the game, you know, in the game for one too many hits. Nobody likes to see, you know, uh, just an old boxer get punched too many times. And we certainly do not want to see an animal of this significance race once too often. The time to pull the plug is now while he's still sound and healthy and can be hopefully uh, a productive stallion in our Louisiana program, which is, you both know, very lucrative. Leslie Gutman joined Race Day America to describe an unlikely bond between horse and human. And I was looking at um, your website and finding some of the videos that you've posted on YouTube, one of which documented a prisoner who had been working with a retired racehorse through the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Tell us a little bit more about him and, and what eventually unfolded at Rudin Riddle. It's a prison farm program where the prisoners take care of the horses, and this particular prisoner, Chris Huckleby, uh, developed an incredible bond with this gelding. And the gelding and he basically became best friends. Chris got out of prison and he was planning on adopting the horse. And unfortunately the horse colicked and despite trying to save his life, you know, he died on the operating table. And when Chris found out, he really just, you know, lost it and he violated his parole and ended up back in prison, unfortunately. Mm. I would imagine the staff at Root and Riddle felt a deep connection to trying to save this animal and every animal you deal with, I'm sure. They're just like regular physicians. They care about their patients, you know, as much as a good doctor cares about a human patient. I found equine vets, you know, a different breed. You know, they're the kind of people who, on their days off, they fly planes or, you know, extreme ski. They're, they're not like the rest of us, you know. <laughs> Live on the edge. Well, I'm going to buy your book and a box of tissues, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Coming up on HRTV Rewind, this week's Racing from Delaware Park. It's going to be our edge to win the Barbro by five. Swift Temper, Alan Garcia will win the Delaware Handicap. And who does Angel Cordero want to sit next to at the upcoming Dining with the Dynasty fundraiser? Oh, he's a whole bunch of them. I, I, <laughs> I would like to sit next to Lafitte. <laughs> really? Because he made me laugh just looking at his face. <laughs> We're going to do a bullet drill that has a Delaware Facts horse theme to it. So, I've never been to Delaware. Okay, now the state okay. marine animal in Delaware is what? Now remember, horse theme. I don't know. Seahorse. It's a horse shoe crab. You're close. <laughs> What's the state herb? Think Churchill down the stakes. Right? Oh, the only thing I know about Churchill is a mint julep, and that's a drink. Yeah, got. It's the sweet golden rod. Golden rod. Oh, golden Churchill rod. in the fall. Okay. Now, this is a really tough one. State oh, the other macro crazy. and vertebrae. What? What is the state macro invertebrate? I have no idea. It is the bird stonefly, and this stonefly actually shows you how good the quality of water is Man. in Delaware. See, you're going to learn something here on that Against the Odds. That should be a Jeopardy Oz. question, not a bullet drill question. Delaware Park's favorite brothers were in the spotlight once again, and they have made a pretty penny for the track announcer, John Curran. Well, you know, we had Nick and run here the last two times there. Um, Nicanor was very impressive on the turf in both his outings here at Delaware Park. Had a tough time down in Florida getting W there, but he ran against some tough horses, and I think he's found a home on the turf. You know, many people forget that Barbaro was a turf star when he first started. In fact, I could tell you a quick story. Barbaro made his debut at Delaware Park in the Chio race at a mile on the turf, and I had already bet the race. And I watched the post parade, you know, they're coming down the track, and I saw this horse, and I said, wow, this is a good-looking son of a gun. I'm going to go back down and put this horse on top. He was like 11 to 1. Turned out to be Barbara. He won by about 10 or 11 lengths. And <laughs> he, won his, he won his next two on the grass, too. He was a, a really a turf horse, and they said that they thought the horse could do just as good on the dirt. At least the assistant trainer said that, and they wanted to try him on the dirt. And when I was out in Vegas in December, he'd still not run on the dirt yet, and I, I bet him at 85 to 1 in the future book out there that year because he looked so darn good on the turf. He looked like he'd go a mile and a quarter, and I was very lucky that he, he took to the dirt like he did. But uh, Nicanor, uh, you know, being a brother to Barbara, does like the turf, and uh, Barbara was a really good horse on the grass also. People seem to forget that. The worst part of the story was if I had gone down the road to the wind casino, he was 125 to 1. <laughs> See, that's, that's a gambler. That's a gambler. We're never happy. We're never happy. 
Top of the stretch, they've got Aridge and Garcia to catch. The six and 12 and three, Aridge has something left. It happened again to the outside, is trying to run him down, but Aridge has plenty in the tank, begins to draw away. Aridge and Alan Garcia by four or five. It happened again, second best, followed by Denver. It's gonna be Aridge to win the Barbro by five. It happened again, second, Denver third, with Sumo fourth. Swift Temper punched her ticket to the Breeders' Cup Ladies Classic this weekend by winning the Delaware Handicap under jockey Alan Garcia. They've got under a quarter to go, and Swift Temper and Alan Garcia still to catch. Unbridled Bell made a run. Here comes Icon Project on the outside. Marina toward the rail. Swift Temper, she's trying to steal the Delaware Handicap, and she's going to do it, it appears. Swift Temper, Icon Project coming on the outside. Swift Temper, Alan Garcia will win the Delaware Handicap. She qualifies for the Breeders' Cup Ladies Classic. Icon Project second. Unbridled Bell followed by Marina. When we saw that opening split 24 and four fifths, the half 49 and four fifths, boy, you'd figured maybe Swift Temper's going to be a tough customer. Here's a case where the pace made the race. And I thought Unbridled Bell was going to make the lead, and it didn't work out that way. And instead, Swift Temper says, You don't want to go? That's fine. I'll take the lead, and I'll relax beautifully, and 49 and change. And, you know, this is a five year old mare by Giants Causeway who's not really a front runner. The only time she's ever been on the lead was when she won the six. Sales and she upset Santa Teresita that day, but this is a this is a, a good thing for uh, for Dale Romans who lost some very high class racehorses just a couple days ago uh, when uh, he was let go by the Zayat Stable, lost Thorn Song and uh, a few others. In fact, I think 12 horses I think were taken out of uh, out of his barn, and so this is a little bit of a tonic for that. Dale Romans Swift Temper Gate to Wire under Alan Garcia upset winner of today's Delaware Handicap. I go back to Prairie Meadows for night racing, the Iowa Sprint Handicap, and I look at a horse like Eaton's Gift, who is fresh off a layoff, should show that keen early speed and go on about his business. Note the distance, six furlongs, a perfect two for two. Eaton's Gift rolling at him now. Benny the Bull is not doing enough at this point. Processor's Turf trying to close in, but it's Eaton's Gift. Eaton's Gift leads the way, Benny the Bull second, and Eaton's Gift will score the upset in the smile spread. Jeff, it's obvious that I will never be a jockey. <laughs> I sent in the money too early. I should have been more patient. I mean, you were right three weeks ago. Why weren't you right last Scratched week? Scratched out of that Prairie Meadows race, ran the up the logic, track on turf. The logic prevailed. I mean, the same logic. Uh, and you didn't follow through. Uh, oh, you've got to, you've got to, I mean, the it's one thing for a horse to run badly. And, and then you drop him, but he didn't even run. Didn't, didn't even run. Didn't even run. Coming up on HRTV Rewind. Racing from different species. Are you ever uh, take part in a camel race? I've never. ridden a camel, but never. Not in a race? Not in a race on purpose. I had one run off with me once, but no. But Humpty Dumpty flying home in the stretch, and Humpty Dumpty took a left turn there. And an update on the recovery of jockey Renee Douglas. Those that go out there and see him and get a chance to spend time with him, he makes them feel at ease in this situation and uh, keeps positive and makes everybody else positive around him. It's, it's incredible. Do you ever uh, take part in a camel race? I've never. ridden a camel, but never. Not in a race? Not in a race on purpose. I had one run off with me <laughs> once, but no. Same tactics, though? For the most part, do you urge a camel to run the same way you would a, a racehorse? No, the harder you pull on them, the faster they <laughs> run. They turn around and spit at you, too, if uh, you pull on them hard enough. The reason we bring this up, we have camel races at Ellis Park. Pumpkin and Fernando de la Cruz jetting out for the lead. Humpty Dumpty's on the grandstand side in second. Smokey Joe in third and Baba Booey in fourth. But Humpty Dumpty flying home in the stretch. And Humpty Dumpty took a left turn there. Who's going to win? Baba Booey, Smokey Joe, and Pumpkin. None of them really crossed the finish yet. Who will win the Camel Derby? Wow. <laughs> Three Camel photo in the Camel Derby at Ellis. I thought that was going to be like one of the fastest races we saw today. Right. Like a quarter horse race. I'm watching that camel on the outside. It's the kid obviously knows that's the fastest part of the track, and he makes the beat. I hadn't seen that. Wow. And.
and they're off. Surprisingly, a good start. It's head in the sand and Corey Lannery with the short lead. Turkey Shorts and Calvin Burrell. Squawk, squawk, and Otto Thorworth up in the second. It's head in the sand. Head and shoulders above the field. Head in the sand dominates. See, that that's shocking. <laughs> Pharrell did, won. He should be against home. <laughs> did he say head in the sand dominates? Did you see him saluting? He was to saluting the and that the ostrich ducked on the down. Right. Did not come up yeah, the rail. Did it in the middle of the track. Exiting stage left. They're mean, they're crazy, and they're a lot faster They'll than those the camels. the hell out of you, dude. They're faster than the camels. <laughs> Calvin, Calvin, Calvin. Claiborne Stallion's first samurai and war chant are represented at Basic Tipton July yearling sale. Stallion manager Bernie Sams was on the phone with a preview. You have two stallions up and coming, Warfront and First Samurai, one by Danzig, one by Giants Causeway. And with the Basic Tipton July sale coming up uh, right around the corner, how do you encourage buyers and breeders to take a chance on a first year stallion? Mm, I'm not sure how we would encourage them, but I, I think in the past people have been very excited always about first year horses and both these horses would be very exciting both being one by danzig like you said and the other being a son of giants causeway that was as good a racehorse as both of them were so i would have to think that the buyers would be very interested in those two horses what traits do you have you heard that uh, some of the these uh, yearlings are showing from their sires benny you know, I think the war fronts have, have been quite a bit like Danzig and like himself, which he looks quite a bit like Danzig. Uh, the war fronts probably have a little more leg to them from what I can gather talking to various people and, and a little more size than what people have, have expected. And uh, for Samurais, they've kind of spoke for themselves. They've been quite a bit like him and, and very attractive, correct, and, and nice individuals. Adina Springs is also represented at the Basic Tipton sale with their standout stallions, Awesome Again and Ghost Zapper. With uh, Awesome Again represented, he's the only active stallion with eight U.S. grade one winners in his first yes. four crops. What traits from Awesome Again do you see passed down into his yearlings? Oh, by far, I would say the biggest is their heart. I would say that if you look at horses such as Ginger Punch, um, obviously, go Sapper. What no one can seem to measure on an accurate basis is the heart that he gives his individuals, and most of his offspring are exactly the same. It takes a true heart of a champion, and, and he certainly, certainly passes that on. What is it yeah. about Go Sapper? You said it's the heart and the demeanor of the awesome agains. What does he offer his yearlings? The physical aspect of his yearlings are, I think, what's most impressive. I feel the depth the roundness of shoulder, the, the, the hip that he puts on an individual. So we feel like that in the combination with the heart that Austin again gives his offspring himself, uh, it's just got to be a knockout punch, win-win combination. Steve Asmussen's recent suspension has inspired owner Maggie Moss to defend his case and the racing industry as a whole. Obviously, this coming down yesterday, the suspension with Steve Asmussen, six months for a positive of an illegal substance. How exactly did this take place? And, and you wanted to join us on the air today to, to discuss what exactly? Much bigger than Steve Asmussen. It's about racing and horse racing and what you do. And unfortunately, when we call it a positive Lafitte or say that there is a substance in her body, you know, we raise everybody's opinions, which you're entitled to, which is we're all cheaters and we're all bad, and it's just bad for the sport. And what I wanted to say is it was an eight-hour hearing of which I think the pertinent part um, was that most of the everybody, not just the science, but everybody, has fully admitted that no one injected lidocaine. Lidocaine wasn't in the Philly. It did not affect her performance. The science showed that. Um, pertinent value, Lafitte, is we told them, test the blood, more reliable than urine. If the blood shows any illegal substance, we'll sign the box and take the six months. And they wouldn't even do that. What's the plan of attack now, Maggie? We will fight this, um, not because, you know, we're just, you know, we think we're right or wrong. We will fight this all the way to the highest courts. Uh, for horsemen all over the country and for the good of racing, and he will be cleared. 
All racing fans would love to sit next to Angel Cordero Jr. at the upcoming Dining with the Dynasties. But who does Angel want to share a meal with? Angel, I understand you're going to be one of uh, 22 other legendary jockeys on August 7th. That's the day before the Arlington Million to uh, be there for Dining with the Dynasties. Could you tell us a little bit about this fundraising luncheon? Yeah, it's a fundraising lunch to uh, help the disabled jockeys and the racetrack chaplaincy, which helps a lot of guys that are in trouble. And the people are going to have the opportunity to have a breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner with uh, some of the old stars of the old times. And uh, it's a whole bunch of them, and they're all very good friends of mine that I have seen in a long time. And they'll get a chance to listen to stories uh, even so that I participate with them in races, I am amazed sometimes the stories they go through when, when, when they're talking to people and things that they've been through writing. Angel, we had Jerry Bailey on the phone last week and asked him, uh, I asked him uh, if I had to choose who I would sit next to of your jockeys to hear the funny stories, who would I sit next to? Who do you think, Angel? Who tells the best stories? Uh, of all the jockeys, who do you want to sit next to? Yep. Wow, it's a whole bunch of them. I, I, I would like to sit next to Lafitte. <laughs> really? Because he made me laugh just looking at his face. <laughs> <laughs> if I sit in the same table with him, we'll get ruled off. <laughs> Scott Hazelton's on assignment in Chicago and took the time to share his experiences at Arlington Park. Do you notice a change since you're back home as far as maybe the uh, Illinois racing family coming together a little closer? I would say, yeah. You know, I spent all day yesterday talking to the jockeys. I talked to just about every one of the jockeys in the colony, and it's changed them a little bit. It's made them rethink things. It's made them, you know, realize things in outside of racing that uh, they should appreciate and not take for granted. So um, it's been nice to talk to them. It's been tough on some of the guys, you know, his, some of his close friends. But uh, I'll tell you what, I, I, we went down and saw Renee. Um, on Friday afternoon, and it was really nice to see him, and he is doing um, as good as you possibly can be in this situation. And if, if there's anybody who's going to come out on top in this, it's going to be Renee, because I've never seen somebody with such a positive attitude. I mean, it was overwhelming, and it was, it was comforting, and I think that those that go out there and see him and get a chance to spend time with him, he makes them feel at ease in this situation and uh, keeps positive and makes everybody else positive around them. It's, it's incredible. That's all for HRTV this week. Here's a look at what's coming up next week, including an all new inside information. They come for home and General Challenge now starts to pull clear. General Challenge daring General on the outside. Warm April at the rail, but General Challenge an impressive winner today. General Challenge was an absolute fireball. Very confident in himself, but uh, tended to get a little revved up before an event. And he was like that from the word go all the way until the end of his career. General Challenge, you get a short feel, he was the man. He just did not like to be in traffic, whatever. He was a big free running horse. Once he got those big legs and acting, you really couldn't stop him. General Challenge now cocking his ears as he comes home impressively. General Challenge rumps in a Santa Catalina. We nicknamed him Rodman because at the time Rodman was doing all kinds of big goofy things at the time. And that horse, he was sort of a big goofy horse. He's probably the most talented horse with a mind that was sort of goofy that I've, I've had. Usually when they have a mind like that, they don't run very well, but he was actually a really cute horse. In his little personality, he had that, you know, he had that real narrow face. I called him razor face, because he had that narrow, narrow face. We had to have special bridle for him so it wouldn't fall off. As a new tradition, we're going to close out the show with some random trivia. You ready, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, what city is Canterbury Downs in? Minneapolis or St. Paul. Either one. Eh. 
Becky got the answer. Well, she grew Shaka up there. P, Minnesota. You're right. Well, what's the death like saying? That's what? still that it's it's you're gonna oh. argue with the original huh. sport of Kings trivia if, handbook. If you really want to get that technical, I would have said Shakopee. I know Shakopee. You I had horses up said there Minneapolis. Well, I mean, we're talking general now. You know. I'll give you one more. It's like saying. At what racetrack did Spectacular Bid run most often? That's an interesting one. Um, not Belmont, so it'd have to be. Um, you know, I don't know. Belmont. Was it Belmont? Five times. I did not know that. Yeah, did I? Me on that one. All He's right. Jeff. I'm a fan. Shakopee. That I, I, I should have known. <laughs> Shakopee. That's that's that is really uh, that's a trick question.